So we are uh, on to another session with regard to drones. And uh, today we have with us Anirudh, who is going to be, uh, who has been an active member of uh, framing the regulation and is part of the policy making in terms of giving uh, information or feedback to the uh, authorities. So we have Anirudh and Anirudh uh, is the founder of Ikigai Law and Anirudh, I'd like you to introduce yourself. Sure, thanks Kishore, thanks for that. Uh, hi everyone. So um, I uh, am the founder of Ikigai Law, the, uh, which is a law and public policy firm, largely focused on the technology industry. So we, we do a fair bit of legal and public policy advisory around uh, all things tech, but I think our forte is really emerging technology. Um, and um, we've been fairly engaged with uh, novel tech, tech areas uh, like uh, blockchain, aerospace, drones, etc. cetera. Uh, I think it was really our engagement with the aerospace industry that got us involved early on uh, with the drones industry. Uh, been active in the space uh, ever since the the circular landed on our desks in 2014, um, which uh, basically shook up things uh, for the industry. And uh, uh, we had a we, we had an interesting role to play in the in the formulation of car um, in, of the car as it, as it stands today. In the sense that uh, a fair number of our comments were actually uh, introduced in that uh, in, in that re uh, re piece of regulation as well. Um, alongside being, being, we've been the councils to the Drone Federation of India and a large part of the industry. So that's, that's really been the, the involvement in the space. And uh, uh, yeah, happy to, happy to have this conversation. Fantastic. I think uh, since you have been uh, very much involved in the policy making and this thing, I think I would like to one, first start with you being able to give an introduction of the state that it was before what led us to the policy making, why we had to get to do that, and what has been the impact of that policy. So it's more like a story on where we came from and why, how we got here. Sure. It is a fairly long story, Kishore. If, uh, yeah, I'll, a brief introduction. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, yeah, let, let me, I mean, uh, so, so essentially, you see, the, I, I, I think there are, distinct three three distinct phases to the to the way the regulators have uh, or, or, or the, the policy for drones have evolved essentially um, there was a time pre-2014 when there was really no uh, no explicit regulation for the drone industry right so you have the uh, the the dgca which is primarily tasked with the job of regulating manned aviation and all regulations, the various cars that are that exist today, um, uh, except for the the the, the one uh, that now governs drones, everything else was largely targeted at regulating the manned aviation industry. So, if you were to ask me pre 2014 as a lawyer, if you were to come to me and say, "Hey, can I uh, undertake this kind of drone operation?" I, uh, we would actually look at the the, the various regulate, regulations or guidelines available for manned aviation. And try to, uh, you know, apply those to the drone industry as well. Um, and that is, uh, and and I think in 2014, what began to happen was uh, there were uh, there were. Uh, I think that was the year when a lot of new activity or drone activity generally started to make a fair bit of buzz in the media as well. So if you recall, Amazon Amazon actually announced that they were going to start home delivery by uh, by by Diwali. Or uh, there was there was this news by a pizzeria in Bombay trying to you know wanting to deliver pizzas etc. And I, I think all of this suddenly shook up the DGCA into action. And uh, this is something that I've seen not only in in drones but in blockchain and cryptocurrency where we work uh, quite extensively and many other novel uh, technology tech industries that when the regulator does not exactly know how to regulate because it's so new, right? It is. Um, it, it, it essentially adopts one of two regulatory approaches. One is that either you just stay quiet and uh, you know let, let the industry evolve and uh, you, you wait and watch and see how other countries are evolving their, their regulation and apply it. Or the other is you go, and, go ahead and ban it. Uh, pull the entire industry down 
and so that at least you are covered, right? I mean, if anything were to go wrong tomorrow, it's not on you. Um, and then again, we can watch, right? Uh, see how other countries are evolving their, uh, their jurisprudence on this. And the DGCA, much like, uh, you know, uh, we see many other regulators, um, I, I think uh, the DGCA also chose the latter, which is to uh, put out the circular uh, in October 14, which essentially said, well, it, it actually did not ban drone activity. It asked for an approval, but it made the process so hard um, that it was a de facto ban. Right? So, um, uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's very, uh, so, so that's, that's one phase, uh, you know, from, from absolutely no regulation to the to 2014 when you had this circular, and I can, of course, talk at length about, so I, I, I have some very interesting tidbits about, you know, uh, the fallout of the of the circular, etc. But that was phase number two, and then phase number three was, uh, I think, for the longest time, the circular remained in place, um, and uh, there was absolutely, I mean, while drone activity continued, there was very little regulatory uh, uh, kind of. So the, the, there were no approvals really that were granted as for the circular, um, and then uh, uh, you know it kind of came to a point where while there was generally pressure on the DGCA and the MOCA to uh, to put in place some regulations from various arms of the government. But, but there was really very little consensus between the different governmental agencies on what that regulation should look like. Because of which there was no movement for the longest time. The, in fact, R1.0 came in after many, many iterations. It took many years. And uh, ultimately what happened was that this regulatory tussle between the different agencies of the government became so um, kind of amplified um, that I, I think it, it led to the third phase where, uh, where you saw the DGCA and MOCA really put their weight behind, uh, uh, behind the sector and you know, kind of do some very quick policy making. And ultimately that led to the CAR 1.0 and Digital Sky. Um, and and I, would, I would say that you know, uh, it, it was an interesting idea for its time, but clearly it has not played out very well, right? It has, it has ultimately... Yeah. Uh, grounded the industry, no pun intended, uh, uh, and, and uh, so we are we are where we are right now. But uh, I think it's interesting. It would be uh, interesting to kind of uh, study each of these phases, you know, and, and uh, see why one led to the other and, and brought us to the place we are in. But yeah, that's that's how I see it. So I think that's quite interesting in uh, understanding this because one among the things that happens in the drone industry, at least in India, is that a lot of the initial drone uh, people came into the industry basically from a background of aero modeling. It, subsequently, it is basically it, it's a lot of information. I mean, a lot of uh, projects that have been uh, you know open source projects which have probably made them enthusiastic and then get into the drone activity. But initially, the first drone people were all people from the aero modeling industry. Was there any regulation to begin with for the aero modeling community? in the earlier days, you know, air modeling was always an issue of the NCC and they probably had the regulation, but out of the NCC, then what was the regulation and uh, was it chaos back then as well? Sure. So I haven't, I haven't studied the aero modeling uh, kind of industry so much uh, really, but my understanding is that there is, there is a, a, a very slim set of guidelines for the aero modeling industry, but it largely was, uh, you know, I was in a state of self-regulation of sorts because you know you have these clubs which would ensure uh, that things are done the right way. But I'm 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 really no authority to speak about the aero modeling industry as it existed before uh, before the drone industry. So uh, my own understanding, since I was an aero modeler before coming into the area of drones, so in the initial days it was very much self-regulatory, as you said we had absolutely no uh, control from an authority on us to say that this is what you can do and this is what you cannot do you know so it was all among us between us that we would think what is safe and what is not safe there was no regulation to the best of my understanding uh, these were younger days when probably we would not have understood the uh, you know impacts of uh, uh, going against the law so we never even cared for it in a way that that's how we did error modeling so, and as we did it, we flew in places where we probably were not authorized because they were, it was a dried out lake. So these are the kind of activities that we did as a modeling. However, safety was only ensured by, as a community, we people, uh, you know, watch over each other and that's how we ensured safety in many ways. 
and scold someone who does something which is you know funny or not supposed to be done these are the kind of ways we actually did it so we were not aware of any kind of a law or a you know mandate on which we were to fly how to fly any no rules of any of these kind i and i also tend to think that because of the lack of such kind of a regulation at that stage in the in the early stage the same thing started trickling down into the drone activity and that's where the problem starts so i uh, this here's another part that i want to uh, uh, this thing so when we did aero modeling it was more for fun drone became a business so the regulation came to control a business rather than the entertainment the fun activity of it can you talk about what is the impact of all of these uh, regulation that has had on the uh, you know the entertainment and the fun aspect of uh, aero modeling and i'll also say more than fun there i i mean i'll follow it up with saying that the innovation that came into the drone also came in from the aero modeling guys so i'd like to uh, extend it to that as well subsequently no absolutely i, I think uh, in fact you mentioned about going to these guide up lakes to uh, to fly or model planes uh, it is unfortunate that even today uh, i i know of manufacturers drone manufacturers who have no choice but to test out their their drones that they're building prototyping um act um, act these uh, you know dried up lakes where uh, there's very little chance of a police uh, personnel to catch hold of you uh, you know so uh, so things have unfortunately not changed too much um, see the uh, you you're absolutely right so entertain while aero modeling uh, was always uh, uh, you know was 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 entertainment first but i think even our regulations of the law recognize the uh that how that the the uh, the impact of aero modeling uh, or the positive impact of aero modeling in new in innovation uh, for the aviation industry so you actually had uh, this uh, the scar which was which was later on suspended uh, uh, you know uh, which which actually provided for experimental aviation and it actually it allowed uh, you know small uh, small scale activity for experimental flying and uh, and it Uh, you know essentially recognized in fact if i'm not wrong the very preamble of that car actually recognized that aero modeling is a uh, you know has that like, has the spillover benefit um, uh, so i i I'm, i certainly agree with you um, and and likewise uh, I, and for that reason even i remember that when we were uh, when we were uh, engaging with the regulators the dgc in particular for uh, drone regulations we always uh, Uh, you know, kind of, uh, we separately make representations for the aero modeling community as well. That uh, just like the spillover benefits of aero modeling uh, uh, in manned aviation, uh, there is uh, there is also you know, uh, I, I think even in the drone industry or the drone regulations should recognize that and provide for uh, pro- provide for uh, you know a, a lower level of regulation or regulatory uh, uh, you know supervision on the aero modeling community. um so i i fully agree with you on that now having said that uh, unfortunately uh, the the very the the entertainment value of drones i think has also led to some of the the prejudices that crept into the regulatory system uh, against drones so for for a long for a very long time actually the regulators did not take the drone industry very seriously for the reason that they that that i i mean i i think this is and i i based this on the uh, on a number of conversations i've had with the regulators that you know what is this i mean ultimately these are toys our, our primary responsibility is manned aviation where the lives of hundreds of people um, are at stake every single time an airplane takes off um, uh, so why why are you you know wasting our time over something which uh, which is uh, which is largely just you know a teenager's kind of uh, a toy for a teenager um so um i think that prejudice also did a fair bit of harm uh, oh, yeah. but um, so yeah, so that's that's my that's my take on it it took uh, took a fair while for everybody to realize that there is a lot more that is that can be done uh, with drones and in fact uh, in fact the future of the industry hinges on uh, efficient and effective use of drones i mean going forward 5 years 10 years i think uh, uh, the efficiency of indian industry um uh, uh, you can't you can't i mean you cannot compete with the world uh with the uh, with the global industry if you do not have an effective drone industry supporting 
but how would you uh, say that you can differentiate between the uh, the entertainment or the hobbies kind of activity from the commercial or the activity that needs regulations how how do you think the separation is done and how do you think it can be affected on the ground so i don't actually want to make that distinction uh, i'm all i'm saying is that the regulator had made that artificial distinction and uh, and and had some inherent bias but but the way that distinction is kind of uh, uh is carried through is uh, one in, in in terms of size and and weight right the weight categorization of drones so necessarily when when you when you have very limited regulation around the use of nano drones uh, and uh, uh, a big use case of nano drones is actually entertainment uh, uh, you know those are like indirectly kind of even though the guidelines do not specifically allow or disallow any kind of entertainment uh, related use but uh, but the weight categorization of course uh, uh, you know allows you to carry on some basic entertainment kind of uh, use cases uh, without without much restriction so i think that's how it uh, it gets taken care of okay so this is another part of uh, uh, the question that came in why see the ban uh, the effective ban came in october 7th of 2014 and it took some time till uh, 18 december to actually get the first uh, regulation out what prompted them to introduce the ban so early on and then have the regulation start working on was there any particular case or certain reason for them to actually enforce a, you know this ban suddenly on the october 7th of uh, 2014 yeah as i said earlier so there, there was a fair bit of um, uh, news uh, the, the the media was abuzz with some of these announcements by various companies and other you know uh where uh, you know everybody was getting quite excited about the use of drones for all kinds of things and uh, i I'm, i'm pretty sure that there must have been i mean uh, all of that woke up the the dgca to act but uh, but as i mentioned earlier the reason for the ban to me simply simply is uh, is a very it's a very convenient regulatory approach that if i don't know how to regulate i am safe for banning you if i don't right. know exactly what because because if i do choose to issue guidelines as they have done today and somebody flies in a compliant manner but yet crashes killing somebody uh, right uh, then it is on the questions will also be raised uh, you know fingers will be pointed at the regulator as well right so uh, so i think it's 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 a very convenient regulatory approach to ban something that you are not completely sure of and then wait and watch as to how the us is regulating how the eu is regulating and adopt those policies over a period of time now the dgca also is it's my belief that uh, they 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 thought that uh, you know and and listen this is true for even the mang deviation industry in india uh, most of our almost every bit of our uh, uh, you know regulations that govern mang deviation have been borrowed uh, from uh, uh, from other jurisdictions right uh, it is just not in our dna to kind of evolve new guidelines and i'm not necessarily using that to uh, make a point i mean i'm just saying that's that's historically that's been the case and uh, the dgca would have expected that it will play out in the very same manner for the drones industry as well allow these other countries to regulate uh, to to uh, uh, to experiment with regulations that we will adopt however things didn't quite play out like that and when finally uh, uh, you know because because uh, the us also came up with for example us and eu came up with these experimental licenses and limited scope licenses etc but not really a full fledged regulatory uh, guidance and uh, uh, so we we didn't really find anything uh, uh, so, uh, i mean the dgc continued to play it very safe basically now what happened i think over a period of time is that uh, there was obviously the demand from the drone industry and from the regular industry for allowing drone operations and uh, there was the pressure was building up on the dgca to a point when they started then they first mooted the idea that we will now uh, uh, why don't we why don't we come up with some kind of regulation and we involve different governmental agencies to to weigh in on this now drones necessarily are a subject area which which are not the sole uh, which which do which do involve multiple governmental agencies uh, uh, right so whether it is the defense the air force the airports authority the mha uh, you know the wireless planning commission from a telecom inspection perspective 
Uh, so there are just so many different agencies that are at play, right? Um, and when the DGCA was finally able to involve all of these people and bring them in the same room to, to kind of brainstorm on what this policy should look like, they were not able to achieve consensus for the longest time. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, it went from bad to worse over a period of time where, uh, uh, you know, primarily, I mean, it was so while the DGCA was concerned from a safety perspective, the MHA was concerned from a security perspective. The defense also had similar issues. Uh, and uh, and these these were all opposing interests. It went uh, uh, and and nobody could could agree to a minimum baseline standard that could satisfy everybody. In fact, it went uh, to an extent where at some point the MHA actually introduced a draft bill to govern uh, drone operations, uh, which was their own bill. Which is shocking because because really, if you think about it, the MHA is not the appropriate regulator for drone activity it is it's got to be the uh, the dgca uh, and this mha bill uh, proposed bill did not even name the dgc so uh, that was the extent to which the regulators were opposed uh, and had dif had a difference in opinion uh, so uh, i i think this was you know it kind of became very very complex it was a very complex uh, issue to navigate through so uh, that's something that you brought up, which is quite interesting to actually know, because uh, it was an open knowledge information that, uh, you know, there was uh, this conflict between DGCA and MHA in terms of MHA thrusting the uh, responsibility on DGCA when they didn't want to take the responsibility. You know, it's something like that. And, uh, but I wasn't comp at all aware of this bill that was, uh, you know, put up uh, uh, in the context over here. Uh, and uh, last thing with regard to the history, I mean, this is my own perception, but 2014 and just the preceding year to that was, I, in my opinion, the rise of the open source software of drones uh, and uh, all of those contributed to actually making it easily accessible and a lot of hobbies actually starting getting into drones and uh, uh, probably dis I mean, causing harm or potentially could cause harm. So, that was when this rise of, uh, and the uh, ban on drones actually came up. Do you have anything to say about that? Um, no, so I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite follow the, uh, the question, if you could just... Uh... So uh, what I'm trying to say is 2014 and the year before that is probably when the, uh, the maximum work on open source drones and the software, you know, because the earlier aero modeling was about craft work you know it, it really had to do upper, it it had to deal with the skills of the person so you didn't have the number of people participating in the particular in the hobby as much as when the drones started to be a transfer when multi rotors became the norm and uh, the skill transferred from everything in mechanical hobby you know craft work to electronics and software development all of these being available components for people to just simply download it didn't really require them to build on any skills you know you you just you know pick out components to, right. from the local shop and then you just make a software and then you fly it the skill was not developed but you already had the tools uh, you you already were a person, player in the market you know you're asking if that had anything to do with the band yes yes um i that's an interesting thought i i don't uh, think so i mean or, or maybe actually indirectly so because uh, as I said, there was a there was an increase in activity. See, thankfully, uh, India hasn't really seen uh, any kind of, or in fact, the, globally, the industry hasn't seen any kind of accidents, so to say, right? Which, uh, if uh, uh, because if if you had one major incident uh, where uh, say say there's a crash or uh, you know some kind of a uh, incident with a manned, a manned aircraft or something, I think that will just completely change the way uh, uh, regulators think about the regulation. It will, it will give the regulations uh, a very different shape. Right? So thankfully, uh, we've not had that and we definitely didn't have that up until 2014. Um, uh, so, I mean, my, my uh, thinking is that it was largely the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the announcements that were made in that year about all this new drone based drone activity and uh, maybe the reason for that is actually what you're saying which is like you know because now there was a sudden spot and you know just about anybody who had a certain bank of mind could go and create their own drones 
uh, and then start doing these kind of experiments uh, got the DGCA kind of uh, worked up about about this. That's that's possible, um, but uh, um, but but I, I'm not too sure about that. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, that's for the past of how we got here and. Uh, what is now the current regulation? How is it actually playing out? How is it, how effective has it been? What is your comments on that? No, so the regulations haven't been, um, haven't been effective at all because they've obviously not, they failed to achieve what we, what they set out to achieve, which is uh, a promising um, a drone industry for the country, right? So uh, in fact, it is, uh, it is interesting that uh, the drone activity in the country has actually fallen down, has reduced after the policy came into play, uh, uh, right? Uh, so uh, because prior to the prior to the uh, announcement for Digital Sky, at least there was a fair bit of ambiguity, owing to which, on account of which, people were able to carry out certain operations. Now, if you go to the DGCA for a license, the simple answer is, um, uh, well, um, you know. Uh, apply apply for a, a license pursuing to the policy and you really can't because that policy requires a functional digital sky uh, for you to get a license so that's uh, uh, so obviously that's not happening so the policy has has done us uh, more harm than good in uh, uh, and i and i think uh, while the the digital sky as an idea was unprecedented for its time uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful idea, right? You are basically giving a license not to a human being, but directly to the machine itself to make sure that if it is unlicensed, it doesn't fly. And you have complete control over, uh, over the operation. As, uh, and that's, that's phenomenal for any regulator. Hmm. Now, uh, while the idea itself was great, it was a little too ahead of its times and, uh, and, and overly ambitious because in the in the time to come, they have not been able to build out the technological backbone that is necessary to uh, to deploy this, uh, and uh, that has re resulted in the kind of the situation that we are in right now. So the policy hasn't worked, and uh, what is unfortunate is that we've also not acted fast enough or done done anything at all to really circumvent the failings uh, of that policy, right? So. Uh, I think it's been enough time for us to realize what's not working and then uh, figure out other ways to solve for it. Um, but we are still trying to fix the, uh, you know, kind of instead of undoing what we put in place and, and coming up with a new structure, we're still trying to gradually fixing, um, uh, you know, the, the digital sky system, which will, which is going to take its own time. I, th I think we're still very far away from implementing a, a workable digital sky model and uh, uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's bad news. In uh, 2018, December is when the car came out and 2019, January is when there was an announcement again for fear car 2.0 draft and that which introduces BVLOS beyond visual line of sight operations, which basically is the basis for enabling delivery systems. So, uh, and I think there was an expression of interest that came out sometime a couple, few months after January, maybe March, April sometime last year. And uh, uh, so, so what is the current status with regard to uh, delivery and le its legality and uh, where are we, what is the current position with uh, DCC? Uh, so as of today, BBLOS operations are not permitted under the car as, as it exists. The only operations, the tests that are being done are being done uh, by uh, a certain certain set of selected, uh, certain companies that can be selected to, to carry out these operations. Um, and uh, these licenses are directly being given by the DGCA. Uh, so it's still very experimental and uh, we are far off from having some kind of uh, solid regulatory framework that enables DVLS operations. But let's be real, we are far off even from having regular course operations pursuing to the policy. So, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm very circumspect of any kind of uh, un bold announcements that, that are made these days by the DGCA, because if you're saying that, well, uh, there's really no point in, um, in, in having these kind of, you know, uh, in, in kind of expending energy on experiments for which are five years, you know, which may, may, may see the day of the light, or sorry, light of the day, five years hence, 
but uh, uh, when we are not not even working on solving the the basic core core problems for the industry. Uh, in fact, I would uh, I would say that BVLOS operations could have been permitted even at Car One. There were enough conversations around the feasibility of BVLOS operations, uh, and uh, I uh, I think very limited scope BVLOS operations. Not not that you allow anybody and everybody to start doing uh, beyond visual line of sight, but uh, but for certain categories of uh, of uh, of operators, for certain kinds of end use operate uh, end use cases. We could have permitted BVLS even even then, uh, and uh, and it was necessary to do so because I think any drone policy that does not enable BVLS operations um, is short sighted. You you really can't have meaningful drone operations without uh, you know because if 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 I have to operate only within visual line of sight, maybe I don't even know need drones. I mean, yeah, uh, you know, I mean yes, they they add incremental efficiency, but. Uh, uh, but the true potential of drones can can only be met if if you allow beyond visual line of sight. So that's one thing. Uh, I, I can do tell you that at the point in time when when car one was issued, uh, the industry was happy with whatever little was given to them, um, and the regulators were also uh, convinced because it it was for everybody, including the regulators, it was so frustrating. Uh, it was a frustrating two years to finally make progress to you know to, to a point where you see a document um, uh, you know uh, is it the final car. Uh, at that point, everybody had given up and they were just happy with whatever. And and the the consensus was like let's just release something, start mm -hmm. some basic activity, and then uh, you know over a period of time we'll keep iterating uh, on the on the policy. Uh, but that has definitely not happened because we couldn't we couldn't even have uh, your basic set of operations uh, permitted uh, on the basis of car one. I think yeah, that's a quite a I don't know. It's quite a difficult proposition because I think once a policy has come out, it's going to be for various reasons very difficult to roll back on any part of it. You know, so it's it's sometimes better to be conservative to begin with than to put an ambitious one and roll back. Which wouldn't happen, so I don't know how that's going to actually play out. Uh, there's, of course, then comes the other part. So I think Zomato is one among the people who's uh, begun. I, I, the, there were reports on their, uh, you know, doing the deliveries based on uh, using drones. So uh, what is uh, what is the kind of activity that's been happening with regard to delivery and the testing currently? Yeah, so uh, see, I, I, I mean, I can't uh, talk as to the specifics of uh, you know what individual players are or what, what stage they are at right now, but uh, I can say that uh, delivery is certainly shaping up, uh, certainly shaping up in an interesting way. Firstly, uh, at the point uh, at the time when Car One was issued, uh, the uh, I, I think the DGCA uh, or the other regulators could not even, either fathom, even fathom the possibility of delivery. So delivery was specifically carved out uh, of the car uh, and not allowed uh, at that point. And nobody was even serious about, uh, I mean, the regulators were not even seriously considering the possibility. But now that we actually have licenses being given for testing, et cetera, I think the, the regulatory uh, mindset has evolved to the extent where they're open to the possibility where they are, uh, you know, Happy for the industry to try try this uh, this out as well. I think uh, in parallel, the industry has also evolved a fair bit. The technology has evolved. In fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, a couple of things are happening now. One is that the tech itself. So uh, there are a number of patents that have been filed for drones uh, or, and use of drones for delivery. In fact, uh, uh, Amazon has some very interesting uh, patents of lake, which uh, which you know allow. Uh, you know, just gesture controlled uh, drone operations where, where the recipient can actually uh, give instructions and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, that's one interesting thing. The other is also there are various business models which are being tried out to enable delivery. So for instance, uh, we are not saying that you deliver uh, uh, directly to the end consumer at their house because that obviously creates a lot of challenges. But can we have mobile ports that can that can move around the city or, or may, maybe hubs within the city where you can have a drone deliver and then you build a build a, de uh, a, a delivery model from that hub to the mm. end consumer. So a bunch of different things are being tried out, um, and uh, and the regulator seems to be playing ball uh, to a certain extent, which is which is great. 
Okay, and uh, that's quite interesting actually what they're doing. Uh, lastly, with regard to delivery, as we understand it, uh, delivery, as, since you, as you said, is in, not legal in CAR 1.0. It's not part of the scope of uh, CAR 1.0. Uh, then came the uh, whole thing about uh, farm spraying of pesticide and other things in for agricultural applications, and uh, by the wording of the car, it is it becomes a part under the delivery which is prohibited uh, because nothing should separate from the uh, aircraft is the definition of how, what delivery is all about. Correct. So and so it becomes an illegal activity to actually do spraying. However, there is an, uh, I think there's an associated document, not part of the policy document, which allows you to do uh, spraying only for a farmer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yet we are now seeing all of these, uh, you know, during the COVID, we are having spraying in the city being done and all that, uh, using uh, drones, you know, the spray of uh, in, uh, a, the disinfectant using drones. So it's, Strictly speaking, not legal. But what are your comments, and how was how is DGCA trying to address these kind of? Uh, no, I think uh, even the even uh, the the DGCA FAQs uh, actually speak about use of RPS for agricultural uh, UAVs for agricultural purpose, and clearly say that uh, you know you cannot use these for any purpose uh, for 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 spraying of pesticides. I think I uh, uh, the DGCA's view is also the same. Uh, but having said that, uh, I, there are players in the industry who are offering that solution. Um, but uh, but yeah, the, it will be it will have to be uh, uh, you know I think you will you will need it to be specifically cleared by the DGCA. I mean you will need specific clearance for anything. But uh, but pesticides is, is currently I think the DGCA's view is also the same. Okay. So I think that uh, kind of complicates it because it needs finally the whole drone uh, policy is there to facilitate and make sure that everybody are on a common framework to actually facilitate the use cases. And as you said, beyond visual line of sight, not being a part of the car is effectively not uh, making the drone industry progress actually, because that's a make great limitation. The purpose of drones is really for, uh, you know, going beyond visual line of sight and automating and without the human presence and all of that. I, I do agree that it will take its time. So maybe we'll just have to wait for the whole thing to play out over there. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, there's a question by uh, Sandeepan uh, from uh, Tropogo. And uh, he is looking at uh, drone insurance. Uh, the CAR 1.0 mandates that there is third party liability insurance, which is uh, you know a requirement for any oper drone operations. But uh, so... Uh, this is not being actually followed and I believe that um, uh, Sandeepan is he's into the business of trying to give insurance but uh, nobody is actually taking insurance. I, I remember the problem before was that nobody was offering insurance even though we wanted to take insurance. <laughs> so uh, do, you, do you want to talk about the insurance, the problem of the insurance? It's a chicken and egg story as I understand it. It is a chicken and egg story. Uh, I think, uh, Sandeepan, you're not alone. There are a couple of other insurers that are, uh, and brokerage houses that are looking at this, uh, this issue uh, and attempting to launch products for, uh, for drone operations. Uh, the, why are we see, not seeing compliance? I think uh, uh, we are not seeing compliance at any level, right? Obviously, the moment you fly a drone today, you are very likely not compliant to begin with. So, uh, so if, if I'm anyway going to fly without compliance, uh, uh, you know, should I further spend money on it and, uh, uh, and secure an insurance policy? I, I, I don't know. But I think the biggest market for insurance in the immediate or the times to uh, the, the, in the short run will be com uh, the commercial use case. So to the extent that, uh, you know, there is, uh, and by commercial, I, I mean largely industrial use case, for example, where, where say the government or the or the or a large corporate or an industry is is uh, is giving an operator uh, an order to fly drones in its premises uh, uh, or operate drones for its uh, for its use, uh, they will probably in their contract want to mandate insurance. Well, they would one they would mandate compliance with the car and second in the contract itself, and they would mandate insurance as well. I think. 
and that would be uh, and i think uh, because of which operators will definitely consider and be willing to spend money on insurance so i think that's the opportunity your typical kind of wedding photographer or your typical uh, uh, you know um, your regular small scale commercial activity uh, is not going to be uh, i i don't think uh, uh, that industry is going to take on to insurance immediately unless we see a stricter enforcement of uh, of the car itself yeah i think uh, i'd agree with that because uh, it's a struggling industry and i think more or less going to avoid everything that can be avoided here anyway breaking the law you're just let's break one more law sure <laughs> so uh, there's a, another question by uh, shashank shrinivasan um, uh, his question is under what legal framework are various state agencies using drones for surveillance so is there any kind of a, a you know a authority or a policy by which they're actually given the permissions to do what they're doing you know so and if if they're not then what is the kind of recourse that as a as a citizen we have we've seen during this covid itself we have seen a lot of police uh, very much putting up uh, videos on twitter and other places of them chasing down people on you know playing carrom under a tree and i have seen a few more videos uh, you know like of those kind so uh, what is the legal sanctity of it I, I mean, we all understand it as an accepted because it's an emergency situation everything is like you know it's accepted over there but uh, th- this is the abnormal situation which should not become the normal so sure okay. so um, under the car there is actually uh, there, there is no provision that uh, requires a government agency or exempts a government agency from taking permission i think uh, in fact there, there is uh, so if you just give me a second there is uh yeah no so they they, they do talk about some uh, some kind of notification requirements etc but for the longest time what we've seen in practice is that uh, the uh, a lot of government agencies and the police uh, for instance don't uh, don't go through the dgca uh, when they are sanctioning any any kind of operations uh, it is a uh, public sector undertaking that seen that they definitely do but uh, but a lot of other government agencies um, and uh, the police etc in particular do not necessarily go through that route at all for various reasons one um, uh, for the longest time there was actually ambiguity under the under the law itself on whether that is required no separate guidelines have been issued by the dgc on this subject um, and then uh, eventually the you know also there was uh, you know because the ultimate league is for the local police to enforce so uh, you know they they somehow probably feel that they are you know any which way not subject to that requirement but uh, see in the current time at least what is happening is that uh, the uh, the dgca has not come out with any kind of clarifications for this uh, for for um, for use of drones uh, around uh, during during the lockdown right and that i think is uh, is in action which cannot be uh, which uh, which i find very hard to justify so obviously what is happening is that uh, you know instead of uh, all these agencies instead of going to the dgc which nobody knows how long it's going to take there's no set procedure there are no set guidelines people are uh, you know uh, so these uh, the governments and the agencies are just going ahead and doing um, uh, undertaking these uh, these operations um, and uh, while while i think the very proper technical technically correct way of of, of doing uh, of of carrying out any operations would be for even the government uh, the state government the police etc etc to take prior approval of the uh, of the dgca i have sympathy with anybody who chooses not to because uh, because honestly i don't think you you would uh, really uh, hear back in time um, and uh, uh, and i would have expected the, the dgca to have uh, so it's not that the dgca is not from, not aware of the situation right Uh, one would have expected that they take action on their own uh, come out with some fast track approval process or just give clarification as to what for what purposes what agencies can fly right now or not like um, nothing of that sort has been done yeah which is unfortunate because you know, right now we don't even have manned flights so there's actually a ample amount of time at hand to uh... and and it's far safer because there are there are 
uh, hardly any man flights. It's far safer as well. There are also not, you also don't have the kind of traffic on the road. The, uh, you don't have people on the road. So, uh, you know, the chances of uh, any kind of uh, collateral damage are reduced significantly. Now is, a, is as good a time. I mean, it, it's, it's a good time for, for us to really deploy drones effectively. And uh, uh, yeah, but that's, but that's how it is. Uh, so uh, Sandeepan has a follow-up question to the insurance uh, problem and uh, he's basically asking a question which is saying that when you're non-compliant, that's fine for, uh, I mean, uh, civil work or commercial activity. But when you're taking up a government tender, then you will have to do a compliance for all of the requirements that are there uh, as per the uh, policy. And uh, this same thing even is for uh, other aspects, not just insurance, like including NPNT and all that. As of now, as you said, NPNT is the backbone of it is still not ready, but you tenders still ask for NPNT compliance as part of their, uh, you know, uh, delivery um, as part of the tender requirements. So how do you, how does one actually justify uh, a tender and uh, uh, quote, I mean, applying for a tender today? Sure. I mean, the, the, I think the only way to do that is um, secure the tender and then apply for approvals. Uh, but uh, uh, and to that extent, I think even if, if it's a government tender, obviously then the relevant government agency also helps you out to a certain extent. But uh, but that's really the only way. You have to comply, and compliance will require you to get a special exemption uh, or a permission from the from the DGCA. So uh, I think the way to go about it is securing the tender, then applying alongside the awarding agency to to the DGCA. So that basically means that uh, there's an opportunity for you, Sandeep. Uh, there are tenders that are coming around and uh, they need insurance and you should be uh, going for, behind them for that. So, Yeah, but no, there are not too many tenders which... Uh, uh, so one, there are not too many tenders because uh, you know, everybody realizes it's, hard, it's, it's difficult to comply. So even uh, you know, you're not seeing as much activity uh, generally. But also when the tenders do come through, there is a fair bit of, uh, you know, ultimately not, not in every case are you able to really uh, put things into motion because you may not secure the relevant approvals or whatnot. So it, it, is, it is quite difficult. Which means that some things are pardoned. Non-compliance is pardoned in some way once you get the tender. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that uh, you may get the tender and still not get the, uh, get the approval. So while you have the tender, you may not be able to fly irrespective. Okay, but still activity goes on. No, uh, not necessary. Uh, I mean, for typically for government, uh, I mean, I, I would assume that if, if an activity is being tendered out, I'm assuming that whatever activity is being carried out is being done pursuant to approval from the DGCA. At least I will make that assumption. I, I don't know if that, that too is being contravened. There is definitely activity by various government agencies where they are choosing to ignore the DGCA approval requirement. That's a different thing. But the moment you put things out uh, by way of a tender, uh, usually you will see that there are, uh, you know, uh, covenants in the tender saying that, well, the operator has to secure permission. Uh, okay. And uh, and obviously, I mean, uh, typically agencies are not, uh, uh, yeah. So so I do know, I mean, there are multiple uh, uh, scenarios where say the MHA is using or the PMO is using drones for various reasons. And they are, uh, they are clearly able to get, you know, they're, they're able to secure approvals on a fast track basis from the, uh, you know, if, if required. Uh, so we, we see, we are seeing both kinds of situations, but during the lockdown, at least, I think most of the activity is without approval because uh, nobody is wasting time reaching out to, uh, uh, to, you know, an office in Delhi trying to, trying to run, you know, secure, secure license. Yeah, I think the whole process of getting the approval from DGCA itself is, uh, uh, you know, mind boggling. I mean, there was la the floods last year and uh, uh, when we, we, were, we were one among the people trying to help out during the floods using drones over there. And it, it was at some point in time, there was a sudden, uh, you know, backlash from the certain administrative people who basically said that, you know, you know, this drone activity at this time will require us to get permission from DGCA. And at that time, it was a requirement that you actually submit it in writing and the whole process would take a minimum of seven days for the approval to come back to you to do that. And this is an emergency. We need you to deploy in the next one and a half hours. 
uh, that's the kind of situation that was there and those are the times when they have actually chosen to uh, at least in my this thing they've chosen to actually ignore the uh, you know policy and actually go ahead with taking a particular certain amount of risk so isn't it necessary that the policy actually takes care of such kind of a situation and actually allows people to do uh, you know emergency activity it absolutely is and i would say the policy actually allows for it also the policy allows for exemptions okay it's like uh, you know the 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 uh, dgca is not really acting on see because what what happens is that any kind of exemption requires you to uh, basically means that you are applying your discretion and which also means that that you the regulator are also taking a certain risk on what you permit right um so it is it is convenient for the regulator to just go by the rule book and not exercise its discretion and not expose itself to risk mm -hmm. and they have chosen to chosen a convenient path through and through uh which shouldn't be the case point is that the policy allows you to do it uh, but the regulator has not been acting so yeah in this particular case it was the person on the ground who chose to ignore and basically take the himself should there have been uh, inquiry or anything like that it would be his neck on the line you know so i would say that uh, you know in times like these if there is action eventually the the, uh, the the odds of action are lower and if there is action the odds of penalty are lower because you know any any such uh, uh, action will also be meted out in the context of you know no, nobody can be blind to the situation in which you are acting and the reason for which you are acting you're not doing this to do some commit some kind of illegality right uh, you know uh, and the emergent nature the 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 emer the scope of the emergency the need for quick action etc will all be taken into account i guess the problem is when in, in doing such this kind of a, uh, you know such this kind of a pro bono uh, activity if something were to go wrong if there was an accident uh, in in that you know kind of uh, while while you're doing this kind of an activity then i think it could definitely uh, become could be very problematic for you but for the for the most part otherwise i think that uh, uh, you know i i would be a little little less worried about action and penalty uh, in these in in kind of emergency in kinds of emergency as as opposed to the normal times i agree with you i would just have preferred that it be actually worded out properly in the documents you know for people to feel safe yeah so so i would agree with that but uh, should there be a, you know is, is there a particular recourse available for people who are uh, uh, penalized on certain on such uh, kind of an case is there is there any recourse that is currently available well i mean uh, you can always make a representation to the dgca you can always go to the court challenging an order uh um, there is actually very little uh, precedence of the dgca acting in any case um uh, right but uh, but yeah you have a recourse in the court so it's just like any other criminal activity that you'll have to you know fight it out as well okay so what is what do you how do you see the future i mean what is the how what is the next stages of the policy how is it going to actually pan out what are the what is the current considerations being taken for new policy so in the in the very short run i'm i i think the the it's all bad news the there's very little uh you know kind of uh, movement that one expects on the policy front largely because uh you know the digital sky the technological backbone itself um from all the conversations that at least i have had it, it's we are we are several months away uh from any kind of pilotable uh deployment as well uh, and uh, the covid situation is only going to extend these timelines indefinitely so uh, i i think uh, there is little hope on that front what will and should happen is that the dgca starts to provide for uh, exempted use cases or a faster way to get licenses uh, on an exam, uh, you know for for exempted use cases etc right so for emergencies for uh, for uh, government agencies so for example i mean there is no reason why we can't have a fast track approval for government agencies 
for PSUs to use within their industrial premises for large vetted and cleared infrastructure projects, right? I mean, a lot of these kind of use cases could have been by now allowed. Um, uh, and even while we debate the larger use by the public at large, I understand the concerns around that. I mean, not that I'm fully, uh, you know, happy with how, how much time we've taken on that, but I, I still understand that's going to take some time. But at least some of these uh, low risk, high impact activities by the police, by the government, by the PSUs, by uh, cleared industrial, uh, you know, uh, all of that could have been permitted. And uh, if not done so far, I think the DGC should now consider doing it. So at least they should actually open out a case by case approval, you know, active for uh, drone use, even if it is not in full compliance with a certain uh, policy. It's so a case, see, they will case by case is still, still open. And it is under the policy, you can, allow, you can apply, you know, you can get a case by case approval. The problem is that there is a intention action mismatch, right? You, you, your policy allows for it, but you're not really acting on it. You're not really giving out approvals. Uh, and there is no, no process in place. There are no set of rules on the basis of which you will approve or deny. Um, the, there is no timeline which is prescribed. Uh, so the absolute uncertainty of things uh, has called the industry. Okay, so that is interesting. Uh, and one more last question that I have with regard to uh, DGCA being the policy and uh, enforcement, unfortunately, um, being a, a law and order problem would come under the state. How is the division actually happening? Uh, who is responsible for what? Is there any understanding on that? See, the local enforcement can only be done by the police, really. Uh, okay. right? What the DGCA can do is, of course, it can uh, it can uh, file complaints or it can uh, suspend your UIN or uh, the operator permit, etc. It can uh, bar you from you know licensing in the future, etc. So so that those are the kind of actions that the uh, the DGCA can take. Okay, so because there was a recent case of a Telangana MP who was arrested for flying a drone, mm -hmm. and. Uh, this is the first of its kind. And so uh, DGCA in this case is not part of that enforcement, I guess, under, as I understand it. It's purely a uh, local. Arrests can only be made by the local police, obviously. And uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, but that's, that's quite kind of interesting because I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's almost wrong to make a law which can't be enforced entirely. You know, it's sometimes it's like that when you're having a situation wherein you don't have NPNT that is completely, uh, you know, usable. It's it's not live yet, and you already have the regulation. We are in a kind of a limbo where you can't comply entirely in 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 complete letter and spirit, but you're still having a regulation which you have to comply with. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but is there any way to get around this? I mean, what is the current? Uh, uh, is it still a case by case that is actually going on right now, or is it how is it being dealt with right now? You mean approvals or enforcement? Uh, as of now, approvals. Uh, during this time when the uh, NPNT and Digital Sky don't st are still not live and the uh, CAR 1.0 is already in effect. So in between now, what's happening? How is it? How are the approvals being given? Case by case and most, most likes are still without approval. So it's more or less illegal that is currently happening it's right illegal. now. Okay. So uh, that's interesting. Uh, and... Uh, what are your, any closing comments that you have on the policy and how we are we going to go about it? I, I really look forward to deliveries being one among the big things and BVLO as being one among the, uh, you know, cornerstones for uh, drone activity because that's when the real th drone uh, power actually gets to show in the markets. No, sure. I mean, I think we've, um, see, we have disseminated uh, uh, we've actually destroyed the, the local industry uh, because of the time that we've taken to uh, get to where we are and there's still very little insight. Uh, so I, I think uh, we really need to have a rethink of the way we are approaching this. There is a point, there was a point in time when the, uh, when car one was, was, was issued, uh, there was a lot of, uh, uh, I, I think the, the problem was that we actually wanted to make an incredible set of regulations which are unprecedented and something that the world will follow. That was really the ambition of the, of the then, uh, you know, of the, of the ministry at that point in time. 
uh, and uh, i think it was it was just over ambitious we we went uh, uh, we lost uh, you know kind of sight of the ground reality a little bit so uh, it was uh, i i think uh, what we need to do now is to scale down our ambition instead of chasing digital sky of course we can carry on on that front but what we need to do is immediately allow for certain low risk activities and certain activities that can uh, uh, you know uh, so case by case is one way to do it if we want to do case by case then have a clear set of process uh, and rules for it and uh, or otherwise we exempt larger categories of of drone operations right uh, as a said industrial use or police use etc and um, subject to of course a, again a clear a set of guidelines and rules but we need to start permitting certain uh, uh, use cases and unless we do that we will always remain scared of uh, you know the kind of the the because how do we understand the real risk to drone operations unless and until we allow some uh, some operations right i mean the way yeah uh, it, it is as much a learning for the industry as it is for the regulator as well so you have to allow certain limited use cases and then see how you know the evaluate over a period of time the real risk that that activity imposes on the society and use that understanding to then evolve your regulations so um, i think we really need to start start um, uh, you know uh, get get things into motion on that front yeah i agree with that and i uh, really look forward to uh, you know uh, the regulation changing but i'm uh, i'm very much concerned when you say saying that uh, we need to lower our ambition i really don't know whether we can lower our ambition means roll back a little bit on what the policy actually asks for no no i'm not i don't mean by lowering i don't mean rolling back the policy not what rolling I mean, back at least parts of it you know so no no, no that's not what i'm saying Okay. i'm saying that uh, that you don't have to achieve so okay digital sky is an ambitious program right, right. If, if we wait for if we say that we are going to allow every single drone operation in the country only when the digital sky is finally implemented and tested and then implemented at scale then i'm i'm going to have 3 years of no activity in this country i'm saying that lower down that ambition allow some activity gradually while i mean digital sky is a good idea be a, be at it but but don't lose sight of the reality we need we desperately need some level of drone activity in the country otherwise your your local industry is also going to be many many years behind the global industry yeah on on that note i think uh, uh, i think we've had a quite an interesting session uh so i i mean i i don't know i hope for to see a good better future for the drones and i i think it's bright but we'll have to uh, deal with these hurdles right now in the short term and in that i'd like to thank you anirudh for this time spent and uh, i think our users have got our viewers have got to understand a lot more about the policy and why we've got here and how what we what we can hope to look forward to so once again i'd like to thank you perfect thank you so much really thank enjoyed you. it pleasure so yeah thanks guys thanks for all thanks for viewing